Hello, I'm Mac Atkinson, lead pastor of Lebanon Church. We want to just say thank you for tuning in and being a part of our online ministries. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. Mark chapter 6, verse 31. Um, did y'all know today, uh, now I don't catch everybody's birthday now, y'all just need to be glad y'all have one, but Miss Chessie Allen is 80 years old today, amen, let's give her a big old hand, amen, amen. now Miss Chessie, I was told I could say that, you know, uh, I've, I've learned with different ladies, you got to be careful about age, but I think by the time you get to 80 years old, you can... You know, it's time to start being proud again of your age, all right? It's time to come out of the shadows, you know, and be thankful. Amen. <clears throat> now, um, we're continuing our stewardship series this morning. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, a, a different aspect today. The day will be different than what you are accustomed to, but aren't they all? <laughs> you know, so that's a good thing. Um, when we look at um, um, Mark chapter 6, there's an incredible story going on. Now, we find this in every gospel where Jesus is actually feeding the 5,000, and we know he also feeds the 4,000. 5,000, we know, is the men. It's not, not that they excluded the women or the children. They were also a part of this uh, fine dining that the Lord provided. It's a very big deal. But Jesus shows us some things here that I think are, are very important, as they all are, but sometimes... Do you know how sometimes you just need a timely, a timely word, a timely uh, scripture? There's all scripture is important and God breathes. But there are times in your life where that verse is going to mean more to you specifically. And so this morning, uh, I believe that's what God has in store for us. And we find in Mark chapter 6, and we'll find this in verse 31. If you would look there with me... Um, want to see where actually um, basically what's happened prior to verse 31 is Jesus just found out that his cousin John the Baptist uh, was beheaded uh, he just got the word and um, he was basically killed because of his faith in Jesus I've always thought that that death would matter to Jesus but it would matter to Jesus even the more not just because he's family but because the reason John the Baptist died is because of his faith in Jesus. Uh, on top of that, I think that's why it's very precious in the sight of the Lord, as the Scriptures teach us, that the death of one of his saints is very precious in his sight. Very precious. And uh, we look at it one way, Christ looks at it another. But, um, but when we see this here, obviously there's a lot going on with Jesus. So Jesus chooses to seclude himself. Uh, to get away have you ever been through something very difficult in your life and you just wanted to be more reserved you wanted to kind of seclude yourself kind of pull away from the crowd the everyday life uh, and it's okay to do that somewhat but we had to be careful because then we can go into a state of depression uh, so we need to be of course reserved some degree but look at verse 31 it says and and he said unto them um, come ye yourselves apart into a, a desert place and rest a while for there were many comings and goings, and they had no leisure, uh, even so much to eat. And they departed into a desert or a desolate place by ship privately. So the Lord had actually planned a boat ride uh, for his crew, uh, for him and the twelve. It was a private uh, party, basically, making their way over to a, a desolate place, but basically... Jesus wanted to get him and the disciples away from everything. Uh, and, and mind you now, there's a time that everybody needs to do that. That's very important. Can I get a witness? And it says, verse 33, And the people saw them departing, and many knew him. And they ran uh, by foot there uh, out of all the city, and out went them, and they came together unto Jesus. So basically, they hear about Jesus making his way to this private location, and they want to get there to where Jesus is uh, because they have a lot going on in their life. And this would be a case right here where there is no rest for the weary. No rest for the weary. Jesus is just, him and the boys, have been, they've been working a lot of overtime, hadn't even had a chance to eat. 
And um, it's very important. That's why I was always told it's not good. Y'all know what I mean when I say a nab? You know what I'm saying? A lot of people don't know what a nab is. You know what I'm saying? But it's basically crackers and plastic. And they know me about six of them there. They straight up down. They vertical. If you turn them to the side, they'll be horizontal. But nonetheless, but, but what happens is, or turn them on a 45 to be diagonal. But what happens, you take those things, but you can turn them any which way you want, but just don't turn them loose because they'll get gone. And so, but, but with that there, a lot of the time people don't eat the, the round nabs as much, the round ones, because they don't get a square meal. You know what I'm saying? And so it's important to make sure you keep nutrition in your diet. And, um, but, but look on here at verse 33. If nothing else, you'll remember that. Um, <clears throat> but verse, 30, uh, verse 33, of course, they, they're making their way out to Jesus. Verse 34, I don't blame them. I would too. Uh, and Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people. And was moved with compassion toward them. This is a very key point in our message. Jesus sees them. He then has feelings for them. Very important. We see the need. We meet the need. But we first have to see the need. Before we can meet the need. Did you know that Jesus could have saw the people. And never saw the need. Many times we see things. But we do not actually see things as they need to be seen. Jesus goes on. He says. He was moving compassion toward us. So what's happening is, here's the thing. Something is stirring inside of this man. And he goes on, he says, because they were as sheep having no shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So Jesus just goes right into it. He, he has his private chartered boat. He gets over to an area. He thinks he's going to be able to get a little bit of rest. And lo and behold, he gets there. He thinks he's on the love boat. They're waiting on him when he gets off the boat. All right? Gets there, and Jesus sees them. And immediately he trades his excuses. He trades his, his needs or his wants for other people. It's very important because Jesus is putting on a display of how to be very, very unselfish and to be very, very specific in meeting a person's life. I would dare to say today, I would rather you not pray for me and just say, God bless him. I would rather you not even pray for me, really. But I would rather you pray for me specifically. I would rather be prayed for specifically than to be prayed for generally. Be specific. You know, it's amazing to me how we have specific things we want, but then we need to pray specifically, Jesus says. Look on at verse 35. And when the day was now far spent, basically, you don't hear that much anymore, but the day is about over, all right? We're getting toward the end of the day, and as our days seem now, they're getting shorter, and I personally don't like it getting dark early, amen? Nonetheless, the, the Lord knows. But look at this here. It says that, that, that as the day is being far spent, verse 35, and his disciples came unto him and said, so they approach him, and they say, this is a desert place. Jesus and now the time is far past basically they're getting there and they're kind of evaluating now now watch this real quick these disciples they they they're seeing the same thing Jesus is seeing you ever heard the expression you know that you know we we in this thing together we're in this thing together we they are in the same boat you ever heard about being up the up the creek and no paddle right Amen, that's the Christian version. But, but what happens is these guys are in the boat together, which means they are in the same situation, which means they are seeing the same surroundings, the same thing. So if we can look at the progression in this passage and we can see that the Lord Jesus sees these people and he begins to teach them many things. So his disciples are with him. They see the people that Jesus sees earlier in this afternoon. They see what, they hear what Jesus is teaching them. But here's the one thing they don't share. They do not share the compassion. They do not share. Do they agree with what Jesus is doing? Do they agree with his approach, all that he's doing? Yes. But they do not share Jesus' heart. And do you know as a believer that it is very, very important that, the, that Jesus share his heart with us and that we actually are able to enjoy that heart of Christ in us 
so that we in return can share it with others. We cannot give what we do not have. Now watch. Jesus gets here and he's, these guys are going on and, and, and guess what? Where Jesus says, this is a great opportunity. The, the disciples say, this is a desert place. This is a desolate place, which actually can get into the point where it's very depressing. Very depressing, man. Really, the disciples are saying, man, this place is creeping me out. This thing is giving me, it, it's really putting a damper on my mood. I was expecting to come here, you know, and, and do this. I guess it would kind of be like, and, and, and no offense to anybody or anyone, but I guess to be able to have something kind of tangible and touchable this morning, is it would kind of be like the day you're gearing up and you're saying, you know what, man, I need to change the scenery. I need to get up out of here. I got to get out of here, man. I'm telling you, man, the walls are closing in on me. I got to go. I got to go. I'm planning. So I got some big plans. I'm going to charter. I'm going to call up Uber, and we're going to get up out of here. I don't even want to drive my own car. And the next thing you know, the Lord leads you over to the Imperial Motel across from Dewey Carter. <laughs> and you get a suite. Anywhere you can go and get a suite for $25.99, there ain't nothing sweet about that. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I'm like, Lord, this is a desert place. This is desolate. In fact, Lord, I'm getting rather depressed at the retreat that you've charted for us. All right. So basically, you can kind of feel these guys' pain. But the Lord says, we can take a retreat and a retreat. Now, now, of course, that's not discouraging going somewhere a little bit nicer than that. But what he's saying is, basically, we did take an honest approach. He says, but there are people's needs that need to be met. And he said, right now, I want to put other people's needs above and beyond. The disciples saw it in a different way. They said, Lord, this is a desolate, depressed situation. And Jesus says, no. He said, this is a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. I'm going to tell you, you know what changes every, you know what the difference between Jesus and these guys right now? Their mindset. It's the total way they're looking at it. It's their perspective. Is it half empty? Is it half full? Uh, don't ask me why we as human beings see the negative. Uh, you know, point in case, if, if somebody today did a good job singing up here, you won't say much to them. But if something happened today and the whole sound system and the guys up there and down here, I'm telling you what, you'll rip them a new one. You know what I'm saying? You'll talk about the bad, but Lord Jesus, you'll sit on the good. Amen, somebody? All right, I see a lot of good people. I don't know what I'm saying. I mean, I see what you're saying. You didn't even want to move there. Didn't want to yawn. Didn't want to blink. Nothing. And so now, watch what happens. He comes up here, and Jesus is trying to teach him something. Watch the difference. Jesus is going on, and, and, and look here. It says, verse 36. Notice what their next statement is. Y'all stay with me this morning now. All right, we need to get a little bit cooler in here. I think it's a little warm. Amen. No, all right, all right, all right. You got an ugly look right there. Um, Send them away. At least I got some kind of expression. <laughs> That's cool. Verse 36. Send, notice what it says. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. That's what Jesus, this is what the disciples are saying. Lord, this place depressed me. And Lord, I want you to send these people away and let them go into town. Well, Jesus answered back in verse 37. He says, he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And I think that word there, give, is key. It says, and give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give to them to eat? Now, I'm going to tell you, there's a little bit of sarcasm in that. The disciples are being a little sarcastic. Yeah, you ever see sometimes when you don't agree with somebody, but even if they're in higher authority of you, you want to try to be respectful, but you'll slide a little bit of smart donkey in there. Amen. <laughs> Amen? You, you'll be very smart with them. You'll be very sarcastic. Can I get a witness? All right. That's what's happening here. And, and, and they said, Lord, you want us to go up there? Basically saying, we can't even buy ourselves enough bread. You want me to go buy these 5,000 people something to eat, Lord? Well, the Lord handles it well. Verse 38, he said unto them, he said, how many loaves do you have? He says, go and see. 
And when they knew they when they knew that, they went and they said they found five loaves and two fishes. Verse 39, he commanded them to make all of them sit down by companies by green, uh, by the green grass. Verse 40, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave them to the disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. And they did all eat, were filled, and they took up 12 baskets of the fragments, or 12 full of the fragments and of the fish. So they had, they had this left over here. Now I want you to notice what the, the disciples are doing here. Their mentality was, Lord, we are limited, which is key to know. We need to realize this morning that we are limited in what we're able to do. What that will do is that will encourage us to have more of a dependency upon the Lord. Very important. But then we realize the Lord is unlimited. The one thing that I think the Lord wanted his disciples to be able to get out of their mouth, his group, his party, was to get can't out of their mouth and say we can't. The Lord wanted people to be able to say, stop saying we can't and start saying we can. Very important. But that's what was happening here. Now, this is a humanistic era. We all are, not, none of us are exempt from this. We all can get to the place to where we feel like, I can't do that, I can't do that. But the Lord says he wants you to say you can do it, but not alone, but with the Lord's help. Now, by the way, if these men tried to make those five loaves and two fish work, it never happened. But what happens is they knew that if they gave it to the Lord, to whom which gave it to them, then they could be blessed. But see, if you notice, the Lord could not bless what these men had until it was given back to God. Very important. See, even if, here, it's a mindset. Watch this. What the Lord is saying is, these people, they said, you do not have compassion. So watch, basically what it means is, in being a steward, you have to give back. It's, it's part of what we see when people give back their children to dedication, babies. You're basically, you're not giving your baby back to the Lord. I mean, you, when you come up here for baby dedication, when the baby's standing here at the altar, do you just leave the baby in the bassinet and walk out and say, Lord, I give you back my child? All right? There'll be times in your life I promise you wished you had her. Amen, somebody? Somebody just raised them and reared them. Can I get a witness? There'll be moments. And so what happens is, the, 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 that's not what happens. So I want you to understand that same concept. When you give your child back unto the Lord and dedicate it, doesn't mean that you actually give the child back in person. But what you're doing is you're making a commitment in your heart and your mind, Lord, this is your child, and I recognize that, and I thank you for what you've done. See, what he's saying is the same thing is in everything that you and I have. The Lord is saying that if you give it back to him, it's just like today, you got vehicles, you drove here. You're not going to leave these cars here and say, Lord, you know what? This car is yours, and, and, and I'm giving it back to you. And all of a sudden, the prison, you're going to start walking by the jail, and then everybody in Effingham who did not go to church this morning is going to think we all got locked up for what we believe in. <laughs> Could you imagine seeing all of us walking by that store? Hey, man, there's a lot of you say, I'm glad I live toward Allentown. You know what I mean? You wouldn't be walking that way. And so... So now what happens is, you know, you come up here, but what you're saying is I'm dedicating all that I have and I give it to the Lord and I recognize that and I recognize that, yes, I've worked hard and, yes, I, nobody gave me nothing but air and opportunity. But then you realize that everything you have, it was only possible because God made a way. He gave you the help, the strength. He woke you up. He kept you alive. You weren't the one that got in that accident that you passed when you could have been in that one, even though it was fatal. God has blessed us, and so we realize, and we dedicate it back to him. You say this morning, you say, Pastor, you know, that's something I did a long time ago, and I appreciate the reminder this morning, but I'm telling you, you would, not be, you would be surprised how many people have not given all unto the Lord. We were talking about in our Sunday school lesson this morning that there is a progressiveness to discipleship, and there's a lot of disciples, even though they follow the Lord, they were not a finished product until later on in their following Jesus. It took them a long time before they became a finished product. And so a lot of times, many of us, we are not a finished product in our discipleship. And by the way, you can be a finished product as a disciple here and live out the rest of your life. You do not have to die in order to be complete. 
And so a lot of the times we are not where we need to be in that walk. And so that's what we're here for. We're learning to be discipled and grad, you know, continue to grow. But what Jesus wanted to teach the people was something. And here it was right here. It all started because these people did not see the need. See, they see, they see how bad the environment is. Why? Because they don't see the need. They see the fact that these people are hungry and need to go somewhere else. They didn't see the need. But watch. Even when they saw the need, Jesus says, no, these people are hungry. Watch. They did not believe they could meet the need. That's critical. Number one, we have to see the need in order to meet the need. We also have to understand that we can be a part of meeting the need. And we have to believe that. Because these people says, there's no way we're going to be able to do this. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, he said, go sit them down in 50s or 100. Now, you know what I love? Watch what Jesus did real quick. Stay with me real quick, all right? Jesus sat them down in companies of 50s and 100. He said, sit them on the grass. Now, what's amazing to me is here they are in a desert place. When I think of desert, I don't think of grass. Do y'all think of grass when you think of a desert? But here's what I'm saying is the Lord is teaching us that no matter what desert we are in our life or whatever dryness we are in our life, financially, spiritually, physically, what the Lord is saying is, he said, I can grow grass underneath your feet. God said, I can create an oasis in your desert. God's saying that no matter where, you, where the barrenness is, he said, I can turn that around for you. See, you would be amazed today, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of us, we'd be completely amazed today if we could see if we could see what we're missing out on, boy, we would change it up big time because God has so many blessings and a lot of people are not in line for what he has. So God's got plenty, but even if everybody were in line, he's still got plenty because he did, he's done what he's done for everybody. And so now what he comes is he comes up, he says, I just want you to have compassion. He says, I want you to be able to see that this morning. It's just like this morning, this beautiful child this morning, we have prayed and anointed over. All right? I'll guarantee you, your heart this morning is beginning to be connected to her because you know this little girl has a trach in her throat. All right? And then sometimes you'll get into thinking for a minute. You say, well, you know what? I, I don't have it as bad as I thought I had it this morning. Somebody else got a little bit worse. You know? And then, then what happens is, then, you know, she's going to have multiple surgeries this week. That's a big deal. All right? So what happens is now we begin to start getting connected to this child. Even though she's a, we were estranged to her coming in, now she, she starts becoming a part of our life, a part of this church. And we start praying for her and meeting that need. And guess what? There's not a soul in here this morning that would not help meet the need of that child because you know that there's a need there and you would help her. All right? But watch what happens. If we read that name off of a prayer, list, a prayer request this morning, it is not the same thing. Yes, God may impress on you to pray for that person specifically, but we as a church collectively would not be moved with compassion until we saw the need. What I'm saying is there can be a difference between you hearing about it and then you actually seeing it. So this morning, that's what's happened. Can I submit to you this morning, well, what God is saying to us this morning is this. There are a lot of things that we see that we do not see. What I mean is you can see things so much, you can hear things so much, you do not see that need. And so what's happened is the Lord is saying, I want you to have compassion. And, not, and watch this here. Not just compassion for people. It's easier for me to be compassionate about what's happening when somebody is sick and suffering. But the Lord wants us to be compassionate about what? Lost people. That's the greatest sickness of all. That he wants us to have a compassion for that. But watch. I think that many times the lost people can be the same way to where we just read them off of a prayer request and we're not actually being moved by that because we don't actually see that. Because guess what? Many times we as churches, we come together and, and we see one another and we're together and many times for the, most, for the majority we are saved. But then there are people who are out there and they are lost and undone and dying. All right? And then we realize that, what is there, 9,000 people or whatever just in Effingham? 9,000 plus, whatever, it's grown. I mean, it was 8,000 here a while back, but you know what I'm saying? You know what the water does in this town? 
But, but what I'm saying is, you know, 9,000 people. Are all these people in church this morning? I mean, I know there's more than just Effingham. I'm not just containing it to that because you may not live here. I'm not being partial. I'm just saying this is where we're stay. This is our station. And we work from our Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost. So we work our way out. What I'm saying is, what are these people doing this morning? Have we accepted the fact that people are just not going to come to church? Are we just accepting the fact that people are not just, they just don't care about the Lord? See, what happens is a lot of the times we will dismiss things in our mind and we'll grow numb to it so we can live and have somewhat of a clear conscience and we start dismissing the obvious. Many times we say, well, that's just the way people are anyway. All right, I understand what you just said and there's a lot of truth to that. But what you're doing is you're programming your mind not to care. You are now instilling something in your mind saying, well, that's just that, that, isn't that, what, isn't that what people do anyway? Watch what happens. You're starting to condition your mind. You're not going to be sensitive to their needs. You're not going to be able to meet that need because you're growing numb because you're already accepting the obvious. So when God says is we're called to be different, Jesus Christ, it would have been easy for them. The disciples were right on point. Lord, we've been working hard. You just had a death in your family. We are in a desert area. This is not in town. We can't just run down the road and get what we need. Lord, what we're saying is, God, let these people just go on the town and go their way this time, Lord. Let them go because they can go and feed themselves because they probably have money. And the Lord Jesus Christ never declared that they did not have the money. And it wasn't about the money, but what the Lord Jesus Christ said is he says, we've got something that they need that they cannot find in town. And he said, and timing is everything. And he says, now it is time for us to give everything we've got. And those disciples are standing there saying, we can't afford it. They're saying, we don't have enough, Lord. And the, and the, and the Lord sitting there reminding them, don't you have me? He says, if you have me, don't you have everything? Or have you begun to lose sight of that? Because many times we can see people so lost, we can no longer see the salvation. There are some people right now in our minds, they just as well go to hell because we've done give up on them. There's a lot of people that we already believe are never going to change. And guess what? They're never going to change because you nor me believe in them. But what happens is when you start being reminded as a congregation that we are more than a man, that we are more than a name of a church, that we are more than just X amount of members, that we are more than, than a pastor, that we are more than a family, that we are more than that, but that we are the body of Jesus Christ. We are an ambassador of God's only Son, His Almighty Son. And when you begin to believe and understand that you've got more than you'll ever need, more than you could ever want, because we are not just people trying to supply and meet the need of an unsurmountable number of people saying that our resources are limited. Yes, our resources are limited. And if our resources remain unlimited, it is because we have not given our resources to Jesus Christ and allowed him to pray over it and bless it. And I'm telling you, there will never be a day in the history or in the future of this church that on any given day when you as an individual give all of your resources to Jesus Christ and you say Lord these are yours just thank you for allowing me to be able to live from it and be able to have life from it but God when I've given you my resources I believe according to the word of God that if you will take these now and you will lift these up to the Father and you will pray over my bank account you will pray over my cars you will pray over my truck pray over my boat pray over my houses pray over my land pray over these things Jesus I give it to you now because I realize these resources were not just for me but they were to help meet the needs of other people I will not pull my barn down and build a bigger barn I will take what you've given me that overflow and God I realize today that we as a congregation have the power and the strength of Christ living in and through us and there's nothing more important and that if we do not meet the needs of this community if we do not reach the lost if we do not disciple the saved if we do not not point many to the one it is only because we chose not to it is not because Jesus Christ could not do it it was because Jesus never received our resources and because of that they could never be multiplied they were never blessed 
and we will never have an excuse when we stand before the Lord. He'll say, you could have met the need. He said, that amount was not insurmountable. You were sitting there sitting back in sarcasm, accepting what was obvious. Instead of aspiring to be great, you allowed your circumstances to control you. He said, I called you to control your circumstances. I called you to be a light in the dark. I told you, I didn't tell your light to get dim because it's dark. You don't, you're not a chameleon Christian. You're not going to adapt to every tree or every leaf you sit on. But you've been called to be greater. You've got the power of Jesus Christ living inside of you. And we should rise up. He said, let your heart care about these other people. Church, listen to me. There's a lot of us, and I don't know anybody by name, but there's a lot of us that are way too selfish. Way too selfish about who we are. Man, you come to the place in your life that I had to come to. I am a no body I am nothing apart from Jesus I deserve to die and go to hell that's what I deserve no bones about it but he saved me that's right amen never too late as long as there's breath in our lungs and Jesus on the throne but this morning we have to give to him we have to give to him we have to give our all I was sitting over there along with some of the uh, guys from the church, you know, was it? I don't know. I'm terrible about past timelines, but I guess because I fo- focus on the future too much. But anyway, but but a few years ago, would you say a few years ago we, as a congregation, and I know that some of you are new. You're like, huh? But um, but let me enlighten you. A few years ago, we voted as a congregation. Um, that's right. We voted as a congregation, and. The congregation unanimously um, voted to borrow the $2 million for the project on 52. And we actually asked all of our guests, too, because there's a lot of people who are a part of this church. We associate you and affiliate you as a part of the family of Christ. Now, we still want you to become members when the Lord leads you, but you come here, you family. We don't have friends, we got family. And so anyway, we asked the voice of our non-members as well. And man, they were all as well. Not, not that that would sway the vote, and it didn't. But anyway, it's hard to be, hard not to go forward when you got all yeses. That was important, you know. I mean, I didn't even get all yeses when I was voted in. But anyway, um, you know what I'm saying. But nonetheless, that's a big deal, man. Anyway, but, but what happened then... Um, we vote on it. And, you know, I hate debt. You know, I hate debt. Now, when I say what I'm about to say, now, I understand that we got some bankers here and different things. I love you, and I appreciate you, and I'm thankful you're there. So, so when I need you, you kind of like a preacher. I mean, they're they going to just come to you when they need you, man. So I, I feel your pain. Um, but at least you get interest off of what happened. But nonetheless, um, but, but, but nonetheless, when, when, we, when we sat in there the other week, you know, because we've been kind of getting to that point, because the church is, you know, you guys have done a, an incredible amount, uh, and members and non-members as well. I mean, it's done a great thing. And you can kind of see it. If you're noticing 52, you can really start to see it shape up. You can see those parking lots and those curbings, and a lot of it's coming together. There's been a lot been done on the ground. Anyway, what, what's amazing and what is so bragworthy is one point, it's a little over like 1.433, anyway, it's like over $1.4 million has gone toward Project 52 in the last four years. And, you know, you see your congregation. I mean, but I'm going to tell you, and I said this in the early going, 
I would rather not one person or one group come up and write a check for the whole thing because it would not mean as much to all of us. Now somebody said, would you decline it? I said, we'd put it toward the second thing. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? It's like somebody asked me one time, will you take lottery money? I'll be like, yeah, the devil done had it long enough. We need to clean it up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, no, no, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, nonetheless, but um, <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? If the Lord can multiply that bread, he can clean that money up. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, nonetheless, um, <laughs> some of you are glad to hear that. But um, you just hear just that proverbial breath. Chris was talking about a shh, man, Lord, I'm going, going to heaven now. All right, but anyway, right, but, but, but what happens is you, you get over there and, and then you realize that for this church to do over $1.4 million is, is an amazing thing. And when I say this this morning, please, don't, please have the right heart and mind to understand. I promise you I am bragging on God and I'm bragging on this church because, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, now, when I say this, poverty's welcome and white collar is welcome. I'm just telling you just as it is and has been put together that this is just a blue collar, hard working church. All right? But I'm just saying from that working class, it's amazing to build. That's a great, great feat. You know what I'm saying? So it's taking a lot of, it's taking all of us to work together, praying and giving and doing and everything matters. Well, so we've had that consent for years now to go take out that loan. And it's just like, well, you know, we didn't need to. Things keep coming in. Why are you going to just jump out there? You know? So anyway, just recently, things have started getting to that place. And, you know, the more you go in construction, you write a church. Anyway, we got to the point to where now that we, we needed to go up there and get right ready so that we could continue with the progress. And we got there the other day, and, you know, everything cost so much. It took, you know, nine, things you don't think about is like $9,000 and some change just for the closing cost for the attorney to be able to take out the loan. You know what I'm saying? So everything just costs, costs, costs. That's just things you never think about. You think, well, let's just go get a loan. Yay. Give me nine grand and you can. Yay. You know? So anyway, so that's, you know, what happened. Anyway, so we get there. And, 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 and here, here's, here's what I want you to understand. Listen to me this morning. You're some of you are visiting. Some of you, you have to understand. Sometimes it's difficult for a pastor to be able to speak to a congregation, because I have from this age to this age, and then I have from this end of the faith to this end of the faith, and all in between. Then I got believers, and then I got non-believers. Then I got doubters who are believers. Then I got some people. So I have a I have a mixture. I have, you, and you understand that this morning. But the Holy Spirit can speak to everybody and do His thing that I cannot do. So I just want you to see this for a minute. And I want you to just listen to me. I realize that a lot of the time when I'm standing there talking to people that you don't believe in what I believe in. And I understand that. And truth is, I respect you. But I ask the same in return that it be mutual. I get that. I get it. There's some people here this morning who have no ambition to be a Christian. I respect you. I wish I could change your mind, but I respect you. And I will always respect you. And I hope you have the same in return. There are some people in this church who do not believe that 52 is necessary. I respect you. Now, I think you're wrong. As you think I'm wrong. But I respect you. I really do. But I'm not called to believe what you believe. That's not what I'm called to do. It's not my call. And you can believe one thing. I am only here because God wants me to be here. I promise you. If you halfway know me, I have a lot of other things going on in my life. And truth is, sometimes I feel like this holds me back. I could be much more successful in my eyes away from him, but not in the eyes of the Lord. All right? But I'm here only for one reason, because God has called me to fulfill a mission, and I want to finish the mission. 
because there's a lot of things in my life I did not finish. And I regret. I just want to finish. And then whatever that next chapter is in my life, then God can begin to start that story. But I sat in that room the other day with some of the men from the church and Michael McCormick and Billy was in there from the financial team just sitting in there. <clears throat> and you know how sometimes you, you know what you're going to do, but you don't really know how it's going to be till you get there? And, and we're sitting there, and, and when I say there's no disrespect, I'm just telling you how I felt. You know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, you got people telling you what, what you're going to do. You know, all these stipulations. Well, if you make any changes, you're going to notify us. If anything happens, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. I don't do good with that. I'm all about having rules. But don't tell me how I'm going to drive my car. You know what I'm saying? Y'all with me on that? You know what I'm saying? Now, if you want my car, you can have my car. But you're not going to tell me how to drive my car. Not my car. Your car. Right? Amen? Am I, am I stepping in the right stuff this morning? Amen, somebody? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Okay. All right. So we get it going. And then it's like, okay, once you take this out, now at a minimum you've got to start paying on just the interest every month and not even the principal. Now you can. Oh, my God. You know what I got to thinking about? God, you have been so good to us for the last four years. Now, it hasn't been 1.4 million, but it started out with 620-something thousand. Do you know for four years we would have been paying on the interest of just 620,000 and it would have continued to grow during that four years as that loan grows? Do you know how much money this church has saved us? by just being able to take care of the principal and never having to worry about the interest for four years? I mean, I don't mean no disrespect to you this morning, but I'm going to tell you right now, hell would freeze over before I bought me a $15,000 camper and lived out my life and paid $100,000 for it before I died. You understand what I'm saying this morning? It ain't happening. I may have to start there, but I ain't going to die there. I mean, you'll turn around and spend $100,000 or something and pay just because of interest. And if you ain't careful, your children will be picking it up, paying for it after that. And right time you get it paid for, the wind blows, the walls fall down. Happens every day, all the time. I ain't going out like that. I refuse. But here's my point. I sat in there, and I know that, listen, unless something changes, it's inevitable that we're going to we're going we're gonna to have to take a loan out, all right, because we're at that point. Because we're down to like 40, 30-something thousand, 30, 40, almost 40,000 dollars or whatever in the general fund, right? But here's what I want to put before you. This is what the, heart, the Lord put on my heart this morning. I don't want Lebanon to have, to, to leave out 2018 and go into 2019 in debt. If we start debt, let's start debt in 2019. All right? If, if that's the, I'm still not ruling out God and what he can do, okay? Please understand that. I'm not being faithless. But I just don't want us to be eating turkey and trying to celebrate Jesus' birthday and got a, a, a got debt. Y'all with me on that? That thing bothered me. So here's what I'm saying. We got... They, they are fixing to start, what, next week, they're going to start putting the form boards up for the con. You know, the building's out there. The pad's ready. They got all these driveways and all this parking lot and everything. Which they're, not gonna, they're not going to pave it to the end just because you turn with equipment and stuff. It's just going to tear the asphalt up. Anyway, but the pad's ready, so they're now going to start, you know, putting the form boards up, anchor bolts, and, um, and they're going to put, you know, conduit and the plumbing and all that kind of good stuff and get ready to pour all right, so that, that's, that's going to happen here as the year ends, and we'll have that there. And then you're going to be able to see steel being erected. That, the steel's going to go up faster than anything else. Will just, anyway, nonetheless. But when that happens, see, as it is, we have a net 30. Stay with me real quick, and I'll be done. 
we have a net 30, which means when we get an invoice or a due payment, we got 30 days before we have to pay it. Y'all with me on that? So what I'm saying is we got one bill right now that has to be paid, not this Monday, but by next Monday. And that bill is for $135,000 to dig in deep, which is, you know, but you know, here's what's incredible. We have paid, what was it, $800,000 plus $800,000 to dig in deep. It's, that's, the, that's the one that's done all the civil work, all the country. And still, that's a part of that 1.4 whatever, and we haven't had to borrow you a note. That church, that is so God, and that is so good. That's an amazing thing. <laughs> Amen. Get ready, Cheryl. All right. Now, watch this. So here, here's what I believe. And I'm going to be honest with you. This is easy peasy. Easy. We need to raise $100,000 this morning to go along with what we've got to be able to write that check Monday week so we don't have no debt the rest of this year. And then that'll, so that's going to get us over into 2019 before we have to borrow any money if then. Do you see that symbol at the bottom of the screen? That don't stand for Clemson. And nor does it stand for Carolina. All right? I learned this last night. You know, C stands for 100 in Roman numeral, right? Y'all didn't know that either. Well, it's good to know we family. A C stands for 100. Do you know the line over the top means you take the bottom symbol and you multiply it by 1,000? That line over the top is 1,000. So basically, 100 times 1,000 would be 100,000, right? So if 100 people give 1,000, we'll have the 100,000. This ain't no joke, bud. No, no. no. I'm just kidding. She's good. She's good. She's saying it's no problem. I got you. I got you. I'm just kidding. All right? But here's what I want you to do, and this is how we'll close. Ready? Unless somebody has something to say, this is how we'll close. I want you to just pray about it. And then we'll come in here next Sunday and we'll give what God's put on our heart to give. Okay? And now, can I say this to you? You can, I'm not going to tell you what you can't do, but I'm saying technically speaking, you should not give your tithe. Nor can you take away from your tithe to give that. Okay? If you're going to do that, let me say this. If it started because I said something, let me stop it. Because I, you, it, it would be improper. You have to realize that there's a difference between tithing and giving an offering. What I'm saying is the $100,000 would be an offering. Now, you ready? I can see the looks on your faces when I said it. Your whole chain, your most faith. Now, some of you said, no, no problem. But watch this. Now, some of us can say, no problem, because we got it. Well, listen to me. There's some of us in this room that could write a check for $100,000 and never blink an eye. That's a fact. That's a fact. Do you believe that, church? But could those disciples feed them 5,000 people? They didn't believe they could because of what they had. Now, I want to watch your faith grow for a minute. Now. Truth is, the 100,000 is not going to benefit the church as much as it's going to benefit you. Year in, year out, once a month, I preach on this topic. And it always blows my mind how money means the most to you out of all three. You care more about your money than you do your talent or your time, in most cases. I can sit here and preach my heart out about talent 
and you're like this, let's do it. I can preach my heart out about time and you'll say, let's do it. I say something about money, you clam up. You're like, no, he didn't. Why? When you believe in the call, do you really think, listen to me, do you really think that we're going to do a $5 million expansion on bones? On people giving the minimum? You really think you're going to cheat? That'd be just like you saying you're fitting to move out of your mobile home and buy you a house and your payment's going to be the same. Darling, you are so wrong. Do you know you're going to have to step it up now because you're fitting to graduate? from this place to that place. But when you believe in the call, you believe that this is going to create an environment, a facility, to win people to Jesus and be able to disciple. When you believe that you're building something that even the government cannot stop, because it's going to be too big and too powerful that even when you're on your deathbed or you're dead and gone, your children will have a place to worship God and soon thereafter follow you into eternity. So important. But can I tell you, let me, let me go on and do something very prophetically real quick. Listen to me. If your heart is not in it, why are you here? Why are you here? Your heart's, he your heart's not in what God's doing in this church. Why are you here? Do you not believe? When you believe, you will see. Hey, build it and they will come. Now watch. What you do is you say, Preacher, I ain't got no thousand dollars, but I got ten dollars. Pray over that ten dollars a hundred times, see what happens. Have you ever prayed over your ten dollars a hundred times? No. That's why you ain't got no thousand dollars. Amen, somebody. I'll promise you today. You ready? I'll make I'll go out on a limb. Ready? You pray over your ten dollars and it don't come a thousand, I promise you I'll write you a check. Deal? I promise you I'll write everybody, I'll write you a check. Because I got God's checkbook. My father's rich. I'm talking about Jehovah now. My father rich. You pray over your ten dollars a hundred times and you don't get a thousand dollars, I promise you I'll write you a check. Deal? Or you can run me out of town. By the way, no, I'll leave. <laughs> All right? But you've never prayed over your ten dollars a hundred times. That's why you don't have a hundred dollars. That's why you don't have a thousand dollars. I see a lot of non belief in here. I can feel you. I can feel you. If you want to go, let's go. If you want to stay, let's stay. Let's make your mind up. but it's time to put your money where your mouth is. Stop talking about it. Let's be about it. We got a church to build. We got lives to win. Either get with us or get with us. But your non-belief is dragging me down, sir. Ma'am, your non-belief Makes me want to say, get thee behind me, non-believer. Man said one time, good news is we got the 100,000. Bad news is it's still in your pocket. You know what? You can't outgive God. Whatever you give, I'll guarantee you God going to give it to you 10 times over. At the church this morning, 
Let us pray that God will give us compassion for this community. That we don't just see it as a lost cause or a deserted place. I love the fact this morning that the Lord could take the Imperial Motel and he put it in somebody's heart he could become a Taj Mahal. But you know why it's not? Nobody has vision. Nobody can see what it can become. But if God put it in one man, one woman's heart, gave them vision to say, you can take this from here to here if you just believe. Let me tell you something. If you will just believe, I'm going to tell you one thing. There will be no church on the East Coast that would be able to touch what God is doing and could become an example for many if you just believe. And in a lot of ways, God has taken this church that would pro at this point in time, there would probably be about 10 people that I know of that are still here. There'd be 10 or 12 of us left here, primarily, bringing a visitor. And them old doors over yonder would be about to close. A few more funerals. This church would have been dead and gone. It was, it was already dying. God turned it around and resurrected it. And now look at you now. All because of the power of belief. If he did it on this scale, he can do it on the next scale. And by the way, my will gear up for this 100,000 because there's going to come a day I'm going to ask you to raise a million in one Sunday. You think I'm picking. So $100,000 is light in comparison to what's coming. But we got to have 100000 before we can, about 10 times. But there'll come a Sunday, I will come before you. And I will believe we will raise a million dollars in one Sunday. Amen? Don't be fearful. Be faithful. You think I'm crazy. I know I am. Let us stand together. <clears throat> Church, compassion. The power of belief. If we must borrow the money, then we'll borrow the money. We'll go in debt. But I think we got something to say about it. Not I, not you, but we. So next Sunday, we will come in here, if not before, or if you give it online, however you do, and people watching on TV or Facebook Live, just remember, you need to give too. I love you. Now, you can't just sit in your living room and take it in. You got to do something now. So anyway, none the, right, I love you. But nonetheless, because you wouldn't be watching if you didn't believe. Amen. But when we give online or we give in church, we buy next Sunday. Because the reason I would do it this morning, and I don't mean this in no disrespect, but there's a lot of you got to ask your spouse before you can do anything. Be as it may. Be as it may. But next Sunday, if you wanted to be that there, just designate it no debt. Earmark it no debt. Fair enough? Whatever you give, but no debt. If you put it in an envelope, no debt. All right? And outside of that, it'll be your tithes, okay? But please do not take away from your tithes to make it possible. And if you visit in here this morning, we'll see you next time. Amen? All right. Let's sing this morning and pray. And this probably be a good time to seek the Lord and say, hey, you know what, Lord? All I have is yours. We do this about once a year. You're just fortunate enough to be in attendance this Sunday. I love you. God bless you.
May you do as the Lord calls you to do.